panel will discuss uh, the first-hand experiences of municipalities that straddle, straddle that urban-rural divide uh, in other places across Canada, of course, right here in Alberta. Uh, Roxanne Carr, as many of you know, is the mayor of Strathcona County. After serving two terms uh, as Strathcona County Councillor, uh, Roxanne was elected to the position of mayor in the fall of 2013. She believes the communities deserve leadership based on the principles of collaboration, openness, and empowerment. In 1996, Strathcona County was granted status as a specialized municipality by the province. The county includes the urban area of Sherwood Park with a population of just under 65,000 and a large rural area with eight hamlets. I didn't realize that. Eight hamlets uh, and a population of uh, just under 28,000 specialized Municipality status means that the province recognizes uh, Sherwood Park and the urban service area immediately around as equivalent to a city for purposes of programs and grants. Rural Strathcona County, meanwhile, is recognized as equivalent to a municipal district for programs and grant purposes. Now, next to Roxanne, everyone recognizes, I'm sure, uh, Melissa Blake, Mayor, Municipality of Wood Buffalo. Melissa elected Mayor. Um, again in October 2013 after serving three terms and two terms as councillor. Being the top elected official for this vast oil-rich municipality brings with it tremendous challenges. Mayor Blake has proven to be a strong leader of change and progress throughout the region. Her determination to make the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo the best place to be for people, business and industry has led Alberta Venture magazine to name her twice on their top 50 most influential people list. And I called him uh, Gordon a second ago. George Murray, city manager, city of Abbotsford in BC. The community of Abbotsford has undergone a number of amalgamations. In 1972, the village of Abbotsford and the district of Sumas, am I saying that right? Sumas, yeah. Uh, were amalgamated to uh, form the district of Abbotsford. And in 1995, the district of Abbotsford amalgamated with the district of Matsqui two for two, in 1995 to become today's city of Abbotsford. Very beautiful city, by the way. Uh, known as the city in the country, Abbotsford is BC's fifth largest city by population and the province's largest city by area. All right, Roxanne, how about you go first? Thank you so much, Michael. What a day it's been. We've uh, had quite the journey. I've picked out some of the phrases that really got to me today. A recent one, right-sizing. Rural and urban residents governing together. That was a good one. And then redefining the boundaries and redefining the communities. Those were themes running all through today. We've certainly had some vital conversation on amalgamations. Well, certainly Strathcona County is a model or a petri dish, as Brian and Manning and I were just talking about earlier. It could be one of the options, one of the results of amalgamation. And Mayor Givens and I got together, had a conversation several months ago, and he said, Roxanne, we think that we should bring a, a few municipalities down to Strathcona County. And we did. We had quite the little bus tour st through Strathcona County. And we wanted to let people see what one of the models could be, one of the options could be, what a specialized municipality really is. So what I wanted to do today is to bring that sense of the tour back to you to bring a, a feeling, a picture of what a specialized municipality is or could be a working model of. How many of you were on that bus, by the way, a few months ago? Okay, well, that's good. If I get it wrong, I'll expect some little discussion out there. With me today is one of my counselors, Bonnie Riddell. And uh, she, too, will be adding uh, a few facts if I get it wrong. So, Strathcona County. Strathcona County is unique, as I've said, in its own right. It's spread out over 1,200 square kilometers. It's in the heart of Alberta. And Strathcona County s s does have a diverse population of urban, 
farm, and rural communities. We are considered a leader in North America's petroleum industry. And we seek to be a champion for advancing diverse agribusiness. Strathcona County was designed as a specialized municipality in the early 1990s. And we work collaboratively with our urban and rural residents as a single municipality. This classification provides for the unique needs of a municipality that includes both the large urban and a significant rural population. Strathcona County is in effect a mini region. It includes extensive agriculture areas, a significant number of acreage subdivisions, and as you can see, a large environmental tract of land called the Beaver Hills Moraine. And that is in front of the UN right now as its own international biosphere. We haven't got an okay yet. It's, it takes years to get that process through. But all this in that 1,200 square kilometers. And by the way, that's one hour driving distance. So it's a large municipality, large urban population, and eight smaller hamlets. As you can see at the top, Sherwood Park, that would be about the 93,000. And as you go down those villages, you will see a Drossen with 514 population. And then way down the list to South Cooking Lake at 294, Hastings Lake has only 92 people. So you see the diverse populations we've got. So the Sherwood Park, we've got an urban service area and a rural service area. The Sherwood Park urban service area is recognized as the equivalent to a city with 25,000 households. And the rural, the smaller hamlets uh, in the rural service area are treated as all one district with 10,000 households. So in total, based on our 2012 municipal census, we've got the 93,000 people making Strathcona County the fifth largest municipality in Alberta. Now part of our land base is zoned heavy industrial. I'd like to tell you the story about this. It's, it's an important one because it talks about partnershiping of municipalities. And that's what we've been talking about today. Well, 15 years ago, we partnered with our adjacent municipalities, three counties and one city. And we planned an industrial area. We planned an area where we could share resources and attract global industry to this area. This regional economic development model now includes five municipalities and three associate municipality members. Alberta's industrial heartland has attracted $30 billion worth of investment and developed into a major energy, petrochemical and industrial area that does contribute significantly to our provincial economy. This is the power of municipalities working together. As a specialized municipality, we have a land base and resources enough to be sustainable in a very holistic manner. We can balance our citizens' needs for jobs, for recreation, and for housing. And that's because we have this very large land base. Many of the people who enjoy living in Strathcona County work in other areas within the capital region. And so you see it's very small, but this uh, population inflow outflow chart is meant to show that people within Strathcona County may work in Fort Saskatchewan, they may work in Leduc, they may work in Edmonton, but also the people that live in those municipalities, Beaumont, Leduc, Fort Saskatchewan, even Lamont County and Edmonton come in to Strathcona County. So the diversification of our region offers increased housing and employment, which creates that opportunity for economic prosperity throughout our region. There are many efficiencies to be gained in the structure that Strathcona County operates under. There's a more effective use of infrastructure, and there's innovative ways to use tax revenue and grants. 
there's efficiencies in staff and equipment, and there's savings in governance and administration. I, th I think we're an example of the efficiencies of governance savings when you compare us, compare us to the uh, Victoria model. So our governance model is based on a cooperative partnership with, with rural and urban community, with businesses, industry, and neighboring municipalities. Up there you see our common bonds agreement with Fort Saskatchewan. We have, we have quarterly meetings with that small city on our northern boundary. And, and you see NCIA, it's a group of industries. There's another one, Fort Air Partnership. So it's all about continued collaboration and partnershiping. And if Strathcona County were not a specialized municipality, well, I mentioned those eight small hamlets, one large hamlet, we would have nine or 10, including the county, we'd have 10 councils. That'd be 100 people instead of the current nine. Now currently our council is made up of out eight councillors. They each represent 12,000 people. The one mayor is elected at large from the 93,000 people. So with this structure, we have conversations with other levels of government as one. We represent all of our different residential, urban, agriculture, and, uh, and industrial interests. These conversations, as you can imagine, look and sound quite different from other municipalities because of that diversity. However, the differences fit within one agenda, one council, one voice. As one jurisdiction, we've got the five urban wards, two rural wards, and one that is a mix of rural and country residential. So think of your own county, your own community, and, and imagine what that might look like. There are significant differences between those eight wards leading to complex issues. Diverse stakeholders having different service and program needs. Agribusiness, residential, environmental, and industry, they have very different land use needs. Council and administration need to understand and plan for this very diverse customer base. Services have to reflect the different needs of our residences. And balance is crucial, and equity between the stakeholders is a key goal. Our citizens also have varying degrees of understanding about their own specialized municipality. And, and what specialized means and how it impacts them. The understanding is not complete. If you're in Sherwood Park, there are people today in Sherwood Park who don't realize that they are part of the county. So it's a long road. The conversations within our current council represent our diversity very well. However, it is a challenge going forward to continue to ensure effective and equitable representation of the urban and the rural wants and needs. The complexity and the diversity of our community has to be considered by every elected official at every decision point. Since service levels expectations are always a challenge, and that is because of the rural-urban mix. Clearly, there are different bundles of services at different levels for all of our residents. For example, street lights and sidewalks, they're very hard to take out to the very corner of our rural county. Just as the replicating that peace and tranquility of the outer rural area is impossible to preserve, to replicate in the urban setting. Therefore, balance, once again, is key. Open, transparent communication with all stakeholders is also necessary. Educating our residents and neighbors in the importance of dealing with the, the diverse needs that we have is, is important. Prioritizing needs at budget time is critical and having frank discussions both on council and with our publics is very important. Significant growth pressures increase our challenges on the regional and the provincial level. Imagine sharing boundaries 
as some of you do, with two large metro areas, each one thinking that they need more land base and more business assessment for their uh, sustainable growth. So you may be asking yourself, what would happen if we were to attempt to become a model, if we were to amalgamate, imagine what would happen if we might become a specialized municipality. What would be different if we joined our rural neighbor or our urban neighbor, and what would remain the same, and, and what would the benefits be? Well, I can tell you from our experience since the early 1990s, Strathcona County has been successful. There's no doubt about it. It wasn't easy, and it won't be easy going forward. For you, it's going to be hard work. You heard the story of Camrose and, uh, and New Norway. There were some hard lessons there. Well, some of the challenges that I've talked about you'll meet, some of the challenges you heard from Camrose will be there, and some you haven't even heard today are the challenges in front of you. One of the keys in our being successful was the vision and the leaders in place at that time. People make these decisions and personalities are at play. Strong conviction and leadership is going to be required if you venture down that path. And a willingness to collaborate and prioritize are going to be there. Well, you might also be wondering about what would be different if you became a, a specialized municipality. It depends on the partners and the resources that come together. And you, we've, we've mentioned here today that the provincial government does have incentives out there. They've got uh, a grant program available to look into amalgamation, to look into a new governance style. So what would remain the same? This is what I want to stress to you today. today. It has been our experience that what remained intact in Strathcona County was the character and the identity of the different communities. All of the hamlets within Strathcona County have their own distinct feel, culture, and history. Any of you who have been to Josephburg or Ardrossan or South Cooking Lake, you know the difference, you felt the difference. We have become a community of communities. So consider the possibilities of a more diverse lifestyle, increased amenities, higher levels of service, more effective and efficient use of those tax dollars, and a balanced, a much more balanced assessment mix you too could have a better conversation with other municipalities and orders of government. Why? Because you represent a greater force, a greater power, and you could revel in a uniqueness. There's no better way for me to express the pride and the character of our community than to show you this video. So we're going to put on a little video, a three minute video for you now.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just jumping up here because I'm not sure if there was going to be an intro after you heard all about us in the beginning, but I'm delighted to be here today to speak at this symposium because I think it's a really wonderful thing when you can get such diverse interests coming together to discuss a topic that I absolutely love, of course, being municipal government. I can't get people to do that in the coffee shops back home, though, so great to be here. I am indeed the mayor of the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, which is one of the largest municipalities in Canada, ringing in at a size of about 66,000 square kilometers. On the table I was sitting at, I saw you had a map and you are supposed to draw your region. I'll just take the top 10th corner of Alberta for you. Today I'm going to share with you the face of the community that's at the heart of the oil sands and I'm here to share who we are, the challenges that we face, the experience that we've had with the opportunities and the promising future that is at our doorstep but rings everybody else's bell too. I'm sure that many of you have heard of the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, or more specifically the community of Fort McMurray and the nearby Athabasca oil sands. There's no denying that the oil sands are important to our region, to our province and to our country. According to Siri or the Canadian Energy Research Institute, oil and gas sector is responsible directly and indirectly for about 550,000 jobs. This presence of, the presence of this natural resource has led to some very intense growth in the area, particularly in the last 15 years. And I'd like to share with you just some of the demographics that have come about in our region. In 1996, the year after we were amalgamated to become the Wood Buffalo, our population was around 35,000 or so. By 2010, our population had grown to 104,000, meaning that we'd nearly tripled in the last 15 years. Today's population is even higher at 116,000 people, though I certainly believe that it's higher than that. Any number that we ever cite is tempered by census rules and residents who won't disclose how many live in their houses for fear of tax consequences. And I always tell them the municipality doesn't want any money except for those grants that we get by the numbers that we have. Nonetheless, I will tell you that the average age of those people who do disclose is about 32 years of age. More than half of the population is between 24 and 45 years of age. And contrary to what you may have read in the media, our community is filled with young families, men, women, and children. And in fact, to substantiate that, I will tell you that there are over 100 babies on average that are born in the Fort Murray Northern Lights Hospital each month. And that's been going on for about, my son's five now? Yeah, five or six years. Uh, there's also a very rich First Nations presence, both on and off reserve. We're partners with First Nations through servicing agreements where we have shared interests. But we're also fostering relationships with local Métis groups as joint sponsors of regional development opportunities. So we are ultimately a very diverse community. Building on that fabulous First Nations and Métis heritage, we're also welcoming the world to Fort McMurray. We have people from every province and territory there, and in fact, there are over 100 different distinct ethnic groups that are represented in the public schools. And I can assure you that would be consistent in the Catholic schools and not in one neighborhood over another. They are everywhere. Hundreds of residents take part in our citizenship ceremonies each year. And this past June, at a ceremony which included only 55 new Canadians from, uh, what was interesting was to find out of those 55, they came from 29 different countries. So, you may be wondering, once they get there, what happens next? Well, for many, it's off to the oil sands and contributing to national household income of about $189,500, which is double the national average. But we must remember that not everyone in Wood Buffalo works for an oil sands company. Many others work in the service and hospitality sector, healthcare, business, government, and other means of employment, legal and otherwise. Another area that's growing in leaps and bounds is tourism, recreation, and leisure category. 2015, we'll be hosting the Western Canadian Summer Games, which is the largest event that our region has seen thus far. And we simply can't wait to welcome those 14,000 athletes, coaches, and spectators to Fort McMurray. But it's not just Fort McMurray uh, that's growing. We recently opened a wonderful new recreation facility in the rural community of Anzac, which is already making a huge difference for residents there. Workers at nearby in situ sites are making use of that very facility, and we certainly hope that it will help to convince more people to put down roots in our region. And we're on the verge of opening something that we're calling Shell Place, a major expansion at McDonald Island Park, which is already one of the largest recreation center complexes in Western Canada. That soon-to-be stadium will actually host the Edmonton Eskimos and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at the Northern Kickoff next June, where we expect about 15,000 or so tickets to be sold. But since I'm the chair of that little committee, I want to tell you that there are still some tickets available if anyone wants to catch that game. But in my opinion, the greatest recreational and tourism resource that we have in Wood Buffalo is in fact our own great outdoors. 
with winding rivers to canoe and kayak on, trails to walk and run, spikes stonebookmobile on, tens of thousands of square kilometers of boreal wilderness, there's never a shortage of things to do outside, no matter the weather. And I'm going to ask, oh, it didn't start. I can't believe it. You were supposed to have seen a barrage of fabulous images about my community. <laughs> uh, if you did, it's just a photo album. It looked just like her video that had those great representations from Strathcona County. And if you'd seen many of them, you'd notice that none of them look like what's in the Greenpeace albums. <laughs> we are, believe it or not, We are certainly more than the oil sands up there. We are a vibrant, unique region with a great future that's ahead of us. Now that you know who and where we are, I will tell you how we came to be, which is really the only reason you invited me here. All the rest was just self-promoting grandizement. The early 90s, the region municipality of Wood Buffalo looked much different than it does today. That is to say, it didn't exist. It was just the city of Fort McMurray and the surrounding rural hamlets, each fending more or less for itself. The economics of the time certainly played a huge role in the decision to amalgamate. Oil prices were down and the provincial economy was in a slump. The city of Fort McMurray was the central hub for services, yet received none of the taxes from industry or rural, or rural communities. Taxes instead were paid to the two improvement districts, which was a structure in itself facing change. All stakeholders began meeting to find a solution to their collective problems, and amalgamation was the major change they decided needed to be made. Uniting these communities under one common banner was a complicated task. It was one that has brought about many challenges, but also many opportunities to continue improving services in both our rural and urban areas. First was structure. There are six urban and four rural councillors plus the mayor at large. The purpose is to create governance that is not dominant, but inclusive, with each councillor's representation relevant to their ward. For example, each rural councillor is able to uh, educate those who work for the municipality, admittedly, most of whom live in Fort McMurray, what it's really like to live in a rural area and even how some issues can be resolved more quickly and efficiently based on their rural experiences. For some of our departments, such as facility services, there's little difference between operating in the urban area than there is in the rural area, except, of course, for the distance that needs to be travelled. Our rural communities also benefit from the expertise that resides in Fort McMurray. Just as an example, we do have municipal staff working and living in Fort Chipewyan, but they may not be experts in water treatment or wastewater management. Being all under one municipal government gives our rural communities greater access to the region's resources and knowledge base. We are even expanding in our rural services, expanding rural services with our dedicated staff members who focus entirely on rural capacity building. They work on increasing tourism, investment opportunities, bringing career fairs to the area, and have a very active presence. We've restructured our Aboriginal and Rural Relations Department to include services offered to all those communities. As a result, the 2014 operating budget for Aboriginal and Rural Relations is $7 million. My capital budget for those rural communities, those values, I won't even tell you because they'll just make you jealous. But it's important to note that some of the communities wish to take on those responsibilities themselves. And I will tell you that we purposely respect that while offering any assistance that we can be uh, capable of supplying to them. While many benefits and opportunities have arisen, arisen as a result of the 95 amalgamation, there are still challenges that we face in balancing governance and operations in both the urban and rural areas. One of the largest issues we see in here is that because our rural communities are more removed from the central governing hub, some residents may feel that their voices are not being heard and that they are still asking for services that residents of Fort McMurray already have access to. So I say, okay, fair enough, it's true. But an example like municipal transit can provide excellent and affordable services in a high-density area of Fort McMurray, but can only make limited uh, reach out to the area of uh, Anzac, being the nearest rural community with slightly more population. What's more, Fort Chippewan is only accessible by boat, plane, or ice road. While that community has access to all of those resources, equipment, and expertise and knowledge, it can take a lot, a lot longer to address issues up there than it would in Fort McMurray, where almost everything is readily available. Our sheer size can be a roadblock as well. And some of you may already know this, but there are impacts on the expenses of running utilities like water and sewer pipes to how long emergency response times are 
in the consideration of how vast uh, that region is, is always a consideration in decision making. But keeping in mind uh, those points, as I touch on one more unique wood buffalo trait, our 2012 census identified nearly 40,000 workers living in project accommodations or work camps for the oil sands companies. And I'm pretty certain, somebody, <laughs> did somebody applaud there? I think we must have a resident. Uh, keeping in mind that um, those folks that are in those work camps uh, will probably increase as we go over. We have an anticipation that there are actually 80,000 camp accommodations available, so we shall see the next time we do that uh, numerology. Addressing project accommodation no doubt requires some creative solutions. There are many who come to Wood Buffalo and start out in work camps before realizing just how much they miss their communities or being a part of community in general. Over time, they end up moving into a home, putting down roots in Wood Buffalo, and of course, when that happens and I hear the story, I can't help but do a little happy dance. However, as more oil sands projects are built farther away from communities in the region, whether they're urban or rural, commuting times become prohibitive. Even as temporary construction jobs turn into operations, the hopes of making permanent workers become permanent residents becomes moot. This is an issue that we're still grappling with, how to make people in work camps want to become residents of Wood Buffalo. Do we build new communities? Do we find ways make moving into our rural communities easier, encourage transportation efficiencies to reduce commute times. And I will tell you, this is very sincere. The only real hope comes from the decisions that Council makes, built very much on the strength of being one region blessed with one significant industry. And that, of course, is where this session is particularly relevant. The only reason that we're able to contemplate decisions that could favor or disfavor some of those outcomes is because of amalgamation in 1995. Amalgamation came as a result of what uh, was a city in failure, one like so very many with aging infrastructure and insufficient resources to provide even just the basic services. We had service expectations coming at us from the residents of the city as well as rural residents alike. We had industry not really going anywhere at the time but not being satisfied that their needs were being met either. We also had Steve West, and some of you may have heard that name in your time in Alberta, and an imminent need to change. Enter the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, or as I like to say, RMWB, because I can save five minutes just shortening it. Amalgamation on April 1st, no fooling, 1995, facilitated by an order in council and uh, changes to the Municipal Government Act to recognize our specialized municipality status and to provide for an ability to distinguish between urban and rural tax categories that I have leveraged to their full extent um, was a benefit that came from amalgamation. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't all about the benefits. We had to make sure that we were doing things the best way that we could, not having done anything like this ever before. I think one of the most important founding documents that existed was the Memorandum of Understanding, which had points of significance from one end of Wood Buffalo, way up in the Northwest Territories border, all the way down to the other where the boundary lines are drawn. We had 10 rural communities, uh, one today has zero population in Mariana Lake, up to about 1,200 in Fort Chip One. And we had the urban service area of Fort McMurray. Yes, we lost our city title in writing, uh, but we still call it a city secretly, don't tell anyone. And from that structure, we ended up with one mayor who has been elected at large from any of the communities and by all of the communities. And we have councillors that are elected in their geographic wards. So we have four rural wards and four representatives in each of our one representative for each of the four wards. And then the urban center, or AKA city that we don't call it anymore, uh, gives us six urban councillors. And part of that again is uh, about making sure that you have the balance and representation. Uh, but I will tell you that when I became a councillor in 1998 and that MOU was before me, if for consideration at every decision-making point, it was extremely easy to think not as the councillor that represented Fort McMurray, but as a councillor who represented Wood Buffalo. So I will tell you honestly that we were all regional councillors, and I've held that to heart every step of the way. Um, it's not an overnight success by any means. There were certainly some trials and tribulations that had to be overcome, but I will tell you that our timing was certainly instrumental. In 1995, uh, with flat and even falling projections for industry, it was likely far easier than it would have been one year later when the National Oil Sands Task Force successfully uh, 
lobbied the governments of Canada and Alberta and projected some $25 billion of investment over 25 years, another happy dance for any community who gets that. Of course, the reality came from way more than that and way shorter of a time, and that's when the happy dance turns to a puddle on the floor saying, oh my God, how are we gonna deal with it? Amalgamation. Very handy. <laughs> Nonetheless, I will tell you very honestly that I believe it was the right thing to do. And even now, I would dare to suggest that the only people whose jobs may be impacted, including those elected folks, are the ones that are perhaps cautious, timid, or resistant to the change. But I know, on the other hand, citizens don't much care who meets their needs as long as their needs are being met. And the reason I'm pretty convinced that's true is that I wouldn't get so many highway complaints when I don't have responsibility for highways if the citizens actually cared and knew who did what they did. As we move forward, though, we must look to all the fantastic opportunities that we have for continued improvement in our region. How can we make services more consistent across the board so that residents in our rural areas enjoy the same level of service as their urban neighbors? As the rural areas continue to grow, like we're already seeing in places like Anzac and Conklin, there will be greater opportunity for expanding municipal services. 19 years post-amalgamation, and we are seriously and genuinely intending to have piped water and sewer to each of our hamlets. Did I mention we're really big and this is an expensive venture? Our rural communities are absolutely worth it. We'll also be able to expand staff presence in our rural areas uh, helping to close some of the service gaps that happen in remote locations. The most important action we need to take, though, as a regional municipality is always to find ways to communicate more effectively with each other and not just paying lip service to the undertake, but undertaking real, meaningful, and genuine engagement. And it should be no different for all of you who might be thinking about am amalgamation right now. Be sure to get all stakers, uh, stakeholders to the table. Be clear about what would be expected before, during, and afterwards. Clear communication, genuine engagement, mutual respect, and a sincere intent to make all our communities even better places to live, to love, and to grow. It's all about involvement. In all of our plans and our documents, we refer to ourselves as Wood Buffalo. We have to walk the talk and to make sure that our rural communities feel that they are included at the table not just the legs holding it up. The regional municipality certainly has lived the full spectrum of challenges, and we've learned through the solutions, and we're very happy to share those experiences when we're asked. So I thank you for asking me here today. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Patty Ross today. Patty is a city councillor at the city of Abbotsford, and if you read my bio, you know that I came from the Fraser Valley Regional District for the city of Abbotsford. She was our board chair there. So uh, when Patty phoned me up and said that uh, Mayor Givens had off, given her an opportunity to speak and would I like to volunteer to come to uh, Grand Prairie, I jumped at the chance and uh, gladly I'm up here. So uh, I hope to only take about 10 minutes of your time today, but uh, a lot of what I was going to say has already been said by the mayors and other speakers today. So I will just blush through some of that. I'm not sure if anybody's here from the Economic Alliance of uh, Southeast Alberta, that would be Medicine Hat, Red Cliff, Bow Island, Cyprus, and 40 Mile County, but I would also like to thank you because your, uh, your old economic development officer was just announced as our new economic development officer uh, as of yesterday, so uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Alberta's being good to us this week. So uh, let me just talk about a little bit about uh, uh, Abbotsford. So I, I actually, for a moment there, thought that uh, having the largest geographic uh, municipality in, in BC was a, was a big deal, but uh, we pale in comparison to what has been talked about uh, today so far. Um, the notion that uh, Mayor Copeland talked about with the two uh, circles, one inside the other, is, is what Abbotsford really is. Because if you look at the map, you'll see the little red line, and that's what we call the urban containment boundary. Everything outside of the red boundary is actually farmland protected by the agricultural land reserve. So we're a compact municipality with a great expanse of, of agricultural land to the tune of, of having about the 80-20 axiom where 80% of our folks live in approximately 20% of our population or in our, our geography and vice versa. So you'll see that we're very rural when we're rural and we're quite urban in the urban part. And I, I actually, staff put in the... Um, 
the median household income to talk about the fact that we're not a rich community, but after 189,000, I'm starting to think we're actually more like a poor community. Uh, we're, we're, I'm just gobsmacked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have some pretty notable residents. Uh, Chad Kruger from Nickelback actually lives in our community. He's selling his house right now because Avril doesn't want to live in Abbotsford. She wants to live in LA and his house is up for sale for 14 million. So I actually know where we can get somebody who can buy it. They're all from Wood Buffalo. <laughs> So anyway, on to, uh, on to the notion. Uh, let me just go backwards for a quick sec. I don't know if you can see the little dots on, on that map outside of the red urban containment boundary, but each of those are historic, uh, I guess you'd call them like a hamlet in Abbotsford, but they're unique communities within the city of Abbotsford. And each one carries its own culture and we actually celebrate that and try to make sure that they maintain that as a rural entity. And, it's important from, um, from council's perspective and it's important from my perspective as staff that we recognize that one size does not fit everything. And that's especially true when we get to the, the half dozen or so hamlets that we have within our, in, within our jurisdiction. So uh, real quick, uh, we have some typical things that uh, this was originally when our staff put this together for me, uh, was about a three hour presentation. So I asked them to kind of bring down 400 slides to like maybe 30. Um, so let's just talk real quick about some of the things, the way we try to manage uh, uh, growth and, and being kind of a rural urban mix. And one of them is with fringe area. So if you looked at the map, Abbotsford has actually got very distinct boundaries. The boundaries are the city district of Langley, the Fraser River, the United States border, and the Vedder Canal, which is the border between Chilliwack and Abbotsford. So we had fairly distinct borders, so there wasn't a lot to change. However, there was one area up on Sumas Mountain where next to a provincial park, there was this small group of folks who lived out in the rural area. And those rural people, um, uh, had some things going for them, we'll talk about it in a minute. But BC, the Local Government Act and the Charter in BC give all the power to uh, annexation or amalgamation to the local government. So the city of Abbotsford uh, in 19, uh, no, it was a 2005, decided to expand our boundaries to take that area in. So we, uh, we just had to go through a process. And the interesting thing in BC is, the folks that we were about planning to expand our boundaries to take in, got no vote. However, the people who lived in the city of Abbotsford did get a vote. So it seems very disproportionate unless the minister of the province decides to allow uh, those, those folks to have a vote, but that's never happened in, I've been in this career for 29 years. In any annexation, they've never actually had the minister do that. So they pretty much disproportionately weight the option for fringe expansion to the municipality. So why did we do it? Well, you'll see that the, uh, the average median household income was about $100,000 comparatively. So it was a fairly wealthy area. It was also rich with resources. Our resources in Abbotsford are gravel. We have a fair amount of gravel extract that comes out to make cement or pavement or that types of things. But the, the density, if you want to look at the, the chart, you'll see that it was large hobby homes on very large areas. The kicker comes right now. You look to the bottom, they were actually had a differential of uh, $1,300 in taxation. So that was the difference when they became part of the city. So they lived on the fringe, they enjoyed the services of the city of Abbotsford, there was no way to actually get in or out of their community without going through the city of Abbotsford, but they had a disproportionate tax savings. So part of the fringe uh, management in BC is trying to make sure that these large million dollar homes that come on the outsides of the town don't necessarily get to use services without another opportunity to pay. Um, naturally there are some things, some people have resident cards, some other people have some things, but there's natural services that you can never charge for with these other mechanisms. So fringe area management through uh, annexation is one of those that they've given us in BC. Oh, I should go backwards. Uh, just so you know, we didn't to increase their taxes uh, in one year. We uh, discussed, we had a lot of meetings, we had a lot of consultation, and it, we phased it in over a five year period. That's an important factor. 
that, then there's always the tax leverage issue. So when you look at Abbotsford and you look at uh, the, the nature of our economy being fairly uh, large in farming, you'll see that the farming group don't pay a lot because the ALR has a natural tax exemption, the provincial government wants to support uh, the notion of the agricultural land reserve, there's something called the Right to Farm Act in BC which basically says if you live on a farm, you can do pretty much anything you want short of burning your garbage. And uh, the farm lobby in Abbotsford, as you can see from gross receipts, is a fairly large half billion dollar economy to us. But they virtually pay nothing in taxes. So, so it's a little bit of what you're experiencing in, in Alberta for some that I was sitting at the table with, where you have this large industrial group outside of the urban boundary who don't necessarily pay as much to the urban services. We have that same type of thing, but we're legislatively barred from that notion. So what do we do? We try to use our, our, the powers that we have in zoning, uh, in, in terms of trying to make sure that anything that moves into the agricultural areas, into the rural areas, uh, is well regulated from a zoning perspective. Unfortunately, um, uh, every time we try to do something like that, it seems that the provincial government comes along and ties our hands. So I don't know if, uh, if you folks uh, have dealt with uh, medical marijuana grow-ups, MMGOs, but in Abbotsford, we have uh, 800 people who got a doctor's note to say they had glaucoma and were able to have an MMGO in their house. Uh, so uh, that... Uh, that number, we've become a little bit of a hotbed for MMGOs uh, in the Lower Mainland. So, the Abbotsford is trying to zone them out of our agricultural land because when you have a large area of land, it's hard to police it. So, the provincial government turned around and declined that request respectfully. So now, they're forcing and downloading on us basically industrial operations into the farmland without the compensating taxes. So that's when we get into kind of this, this uh, lobbying effort to try to level that playing field. And I think as local government, um, you as local government elected officials have the hardest job. Uh, we were talking about the table this morning. You're the closest to the constituent. You get the most grief on a 24-hour basis. And you don't necessarily control your own destiny. And that's where somebody was talking about FCM, and in our case, it's the Union of BC Municipalities, to lobby the provincial government to change some of these regulatory regimes. Because without your voice, um, staff can't deliver what you need. And, and certainly in, in our area with taxation, we're pretty much handcuffed to having a disproportionate tax regime. But that's one that uh, we just have to live with. That then there's the governance, and, and both mayors talked about the fact that you have to engage your constituents in a very meaningful way. So the way Abbotsford does it is, um, is we don't have a ward system, but pretty much for the last three or four elections, it's virtually broken down into a ward system where we have two from the rural area, one from area H, which is the area that uh, we annexed, and then the rest from the uh, urban area. Um, we try to celebrate the differences in the, in, in the way we, we do business in the governance model and, and try to ensure that we balance the interests of the various communities. And I'm trying to go really quick because I know we're late. One of the ways we do it is we actually structurally set up the governance to meet an urban and rural mix. So if you look on the, on the rural side, you'll see that for the folks that are in the farmlands, it's really important that their diking drainage and irrigation districts function effectively. That's how their business works. So we have specific governance committees for those areas where those folks have as much delegated authority as we can possibly give them and they have a control over their own destiny for what's important to them. So all the urban people actually have the storm runoff on their pavement going into the rural area, but we give that authority and power through those committees and council then ratifies it to make those decisions around that. We also have an agriculture advisory committee. That's huge in our community because agriculture needs a say in what's gonna to happen to a half billion dollar farm receipts. So every planning initiative that is going to be undertaken that goes through our city, goes through the Agricultural Advisory Committee, if it has any potential impact, even if it's in the urban area, it goes through the AAC if it has an impact on agricultural lands. And then you'll see that when we, we started to annex uh, Area H, we created a special committee for the rural folks. 
who had a say in the way A, City Hall worked, B, how it would affect their land use coming up. And for five years they've met and they've slowly talked about how do their predominantly rural nature get rolled into a predominantly urban area. And the good news is we're in our sixth year of that committee and nobody wants to come anymore. So that's usually the success of a committee when nobody wants to attend a meeting. They've kind of done their bidding and I think at the end of uh, November when we go into our, we're starting our elections now on November 15th, 16th, uh, I think that committee will slowly go away and they'll now be assimilated into the community. But that took six years of consultation, community hall meetings, discussions, listening, adapting our service levels and actually paying attention to their concerns. Uh, then there's the rural areas all have ratepayers or farmers institutes. Next week we're going out to meet with one of them and, and it's not a true agenda but we bring our senior staff out, we bring our council out and we sit down knee to knee, nose to nose and we listen to what they have to say. The urban folks don't get that same say. There's 118,000 in the urban area and they, uh, they don't get nearly as much say in the delivery of services in the urban area as the rural people do. But that sense of community that those little circular nodes or the hamlets had um, require that much more degree of, of, of treatment in Abbotsford, at least. And then there's some natural things that only the urban cares about. I think the, one of the mayors talked about transit. You're just not going to try to put transit out into a rural area where there's like one house per you know, mile. So, so those are more urban areas and that's what the constituents and the, and the folks that represent get put on representation committees come from the urban areas for our urban committees. We're very thoughtful about this, so it's not just a random, here's some committees. We think it through and we try to make sure that they have a say in the way we govern. Then there's always the argument about establishing service levels, which uh, one of the mayors talked about. Naturally, you're gonna try to get water, uh, potable water out everywhere, planning, building, those types of things have to be on a region-wide basis. But we've convinced the rural ratepayers groups that there's some things that they're never going to get. They're never going to get sanitary sewer. They're never going to get a transit system. They have to accept that they're, they're not paying as much in taxes and they're not going to have the same level of service for policing, for drainage, for some other things. The interesting kicker, and, and, and there's probably a hundred of these that I could go through, but is the fire departments. So these are our fire zones. And the rural folks accept that we have four full-time fire halls in our urban area. They understand that they cover the rural area, but then we have four composite or uh, paid on call, some people call them volunteer firefighters, fire, fire uh, departments in the rural areas. So they understand that their fire delivery service, which is a life safety issue, may not be to the same level as if you were on George Ferguson Way on downtown Abbotsford. And that's fully accepted. And the thing of it is that those rural fire departments actually contribute to the culture and the ethos of their communities. So in a backhanded way, we're saving money, but we're also supporting those local communities. We're currently in the process of replacing two fire halls, and we're actually working and sitting down with not only the volunteer fire department who operates out of there, but we're actually sitting down with the community associations and helping them design our fire halls. So each one is gonna have unique flavor to their communities. And, and it may cost a little bit more, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have way better buy-in from your constituents. <clears throat> so, what's a little bit different in BC than you have in, uh, in, in Alberta? We have something called the regional district system. Is anybody familiar with the uh, regional district system? There's a few. Excellent. So this is uh, imposed a long time ago. There's uh, 60 regional districts. Uh, going backwards, ours is in the bottom. It's the uh, Fraser Valley Regional District. We're right on the, um, the neighborhood to Metro Vancouver, which is the big behemoth of Vancouver, Richmond, Burnaby, Surrey, all those great big places. We like to be a little bit different. So a regional district is different than a regional municipality in Ontario or a county in Alberta. It, it, some people call it a fourth level of government. It, it's not, it's a federation of, of government. So it's a form of all the rural areas in, and the truly rural areas uh, in, in, uh, in the regional district, plus the cities form a federated board and it's a self standing organization that has its own autonomy. The municipal directors are appointed from council 
and the uh, rural directors are actually elected from their area. So there's unincorporated areas. So they have three fun fundamental purposes. They provide local government services to those unincorporated hamlets. Some of them could be 300, some of them could be 20. But they will provide water, sewer, drainage, all those types of things. There's no roads, there's no police. They pay those into the provincial government. And then they also provide something called regional or sub-regional services. And that's where some of the partnerships between the city of Abbotsford and the Fraser Valley Regional District come in because we have the ability then to start to develop partnerships in a different way. I'm going to talk about that in a quick sec. So how does it work? Well, the service area is actually, you get to belong when you choose to belong. Nobody's ever forced into them. They set their own budget, they set their own tax rates, cities collect for, for the regional district on behalf of the region, but the province collects on behalf of the regional district in the rural areas. So they're completely a separate, different line on the tax notice. They have a separate governance, a separate administration, and there's um, an ability for, um, for the, government, the governance to be weighted. So if you participate in an activity at the regional level, you get a say. You pay, there's a saying, you pay, you play. So you get to have a vote. If you don't participate, you sit on the sidelines and watch those that do. So it's a little bit like going to an a la carte menu restaurant. So if you choose to have this, you can participate. If you choose not to, you don't have to. But it creates a unique blend of circumstances that helps deliver services in a unique way. And if you choose that you no longer want to be part of that, there's a process to work yourself out of a service and allow you to, to get out with some specific services that are too complicated to worry about today. So this is our regional district, Fraser Valley Regional District, and you'll see the green dots are actually the five or six communities that form the urban areas, the cities, and the rest is white. So it, it's a, if you think about Abbotsford being a fairly large municipality in BC, that's a fairly decent sized regional district, um, about uh, 250,000 people. Uh, you'll see that uh, most of it is actually in crown, crown land, but there's a certain amount that is straight up rural. So there's folks in, if, has anybody been to Hell's Gate coming down the Fraser Canyon? That's in the Fraser Regional District. Boston Bar is in fact a, one of those hamlets. So they have an elected person for electoral area uh, A. Uh, that's uh, Hell's Gate and he comes down and he has a water system, he has a bowling alley, he has a TV station up in that area and only the folks who benefit from it get to buy those services but it's all managed through that centralized government system. So real quick, uh, that doesn't matter because we're late. Um, I'm kind of a quick cut to the chase kind of guy. So um, this is also a way for the province of BC, I don't know if, I heard local improvement areas and I'm not sure what that means in Alberta, but in BC it usually means a bunch of volunteers that do a really, try really hard but have a hard time delivering some really important services, sometimes a fire department, sometimes a water system. Our province is slowly trying to phase them out and put them all into the regional district so that all planning, fire, utilities, any local government service gets delivered through this professional body called the regional district. And it provides some opportunities. Then there's this other notion about how do we get together as a federation and for us, we're still dealing with the fact that we don't have treaties. So First Nation land claims and how we manage uh, First Nations issues is a huge issue. That's done at the regional level. Um, uh, it's a vehicle for shared service. So the District of uh, Hope, a small town, it's actually a town of Hope, has about 5,000 people who sit on the outside of the original city of Hope, which was 5,000. They wanted to put in a rec center. What they said is, if we were gonna put in a rec center, you people on the fringe have to pay. They created a service area of just a few different areas. Boom, they got their rec center, but the entire area, it doesn't matter if you're inside the city or outside the city, they all pay. Um, there's some really creative ones. Uh, there's some recreation services in Nanaimo. Uh, there's some transit. And if you go to Metro Vancouver and you look at the way they do sewer treatment and the, actually the water transmission system, that's Metro Vancouver. So, that saves Vancouver, 
that saves uh, Vancouver, Burnaby, Richmond, all those large municipalities that could probably do it on their own. They partner together in a shared service sense through this federation and they do it more efficiently and at a better cost or a, a better governance. And you can do, I talked about bowling alleys, TV stations, there's boat docks, there's evasive plants. They can do anything they want that you can raise an idea for that's legal. There are some things that a regional district has to do. And, and the one that I like is, is uh, regional planning. So um, that requires what's called a regional growth strategy. So a regional growth strategy is where every municipality has to talk about how it's going to grow and we sit down and we talk with the provincial government, the ALR, the pro very pro various provincial uh, ministries, but then we also talk to our neighboring regional districts. So we're trying to have planned, sensible growth on a regional basis for everywhere that a regional district touches on one, one another. The other piece that we're trying to get done in BC in a sensible way is solid waste management. So solid waste management, how we deal with recycling, how we deal with garbage, uh, landfills, or in our case, uh, we're fighting Metro over an incinerator. That gets done at a regional district level, so there's a consistent, consolidated place to go and have a service delivered and have that public policy debate at a higher level so that one municipality isn't trying to deliver poorer service in, in an environmental area. The last thing is, I'm not sure if you've heard of the MFA, the Municipal Finance Authority but the Municipal Finance Authority is a AAA bond rated organization that goes to New York and floats uh, bonds on behalf of all of municipalities and regional districts in BC. The credit rating is actually better than the province uh, of BC's credit rating. So municipalities actually float their bonds at a cheaper rate and it's all guaranteed through these federations. So if Abbotsford's borrowing $50 million for a rec center, that means everybody else in our region is helping to guarantee our bond, thereby bringing down the risk, and that risk then brings in better rates. So those, and lastly, uh, we also do capital funding for hospitals. So those are some of the fundamentals of a, of a regional district that I believe are very fundamental to the way BC operates and how we manage some of those rural urban interfaces, but it also requires us to be consistent and consolidated in when all the regions are going together. That we can go through real quick. Um, so there's some things, it's a creative process, it's extremely flexible, it's based on your population and your assessments, so it's a weighted average. So if you're Abbotsford, you have 48% of the vote at the regional district. If you're Boston Bar, I don't know what you get, you get like one or 2%. It's, so there is some equity in the governance system, but it's, it's also fair and equitable and everybody gets to say. So, there we go. Tried to save 10 minutes.